Hi and welcome. We're so excited that you chose to join us today. And we hope that this message will inspire you to live the life that God designed you to live. For this message or others like it, you can go to our website or you can find us on our YouTube channel. Now sit back, relax, enjoy this message. Well, God's good. Praise the Lord. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. You should have, uh, when you came in this morning, did they get a communication card? When you came in this morning, you should have got a communication card. Just want to encourage you to fill that out if you uh, need to update your information uh, with us. Also, there's a couple of questions there. Um, we're having a burger night tonight with the men. This is for all men. It starts at 5.30 tonight, and so if you're going to be a part of that, make sure you check that, put your name there. We have about uh, 30 or 40 guys signed up, something like that, and so that will be here at the church at, at 5.30. So if you're a guy, please, you're welcome to join us. Also on the communication card is a father-daughter, mother-son bash. Yes, my name is Gina Dolan, and I'm the administrator here at the Academy, and we are having a fundraiser. Um, it's a daddy-daughter dance and a mother-son bash, and it's this Friday night, and it's all right here. So the dads and the daughters will be here, and then the moms and the sons will be in the back, and we it's a Lego theme, and it's going to be really fun. They're going to have games for, you know, both groups, and there will be food and snacks and dancing and so it's really going to be a fun time that you can take your either your son or your daughter out uh, for a really fun evening. It starts at 6.30, and they will also be able to get their picture taken um, you know, with their, their mom or their dad, whichever it be. Or if, if that um, you know, doesn't work out and they want to bring you know, a grandparent or even another a friend of the family, that is awesome. You know, that's great, too. So we hope that you can come, and Alicia Balls will be um, at the door in the back of church uh, at the very end, and you can sign up with her so you can still get signed up um, for this weekend. So thank you. We hope to see you. Amen. So if you fill out that communication card as soon as I receive the offering, please put it in the offering bucket so that we can uh, know what's happening in your life. Uh, also, um, I want to receive the offering, so if the ushers could please come forward, and uh, if you have a cash gift and would like a receipt, one of these ushers will give you an offering envelope. Uh, if you're making out a check, you can make it out to Destiny Church. You know, I was thinking this about giving. Um, sometimes when you talk about money, people sort of tense up. H how many of you ever felt that a little bit? Like people kind of tense up, like, Ur. this is something very important to me that you're talking about at this moment. And, um, and the thing about it is, you know, I always say this, that if you're going to be involved in something, you should know what the Bible says about it. Doesn't that make sense? Unless you're not going to be involved. If you're not going to be involved, then you don't care what the Bible says about it. But if, you, if you're going to be involved with it, if you're going to be involved in giving, then it really behooves you to know what the Bible says about it. And, and then so you give according to knowledge, you give according to faith, and you reap a benefit from it. Because there is actually a benefit in giving. Um, you know, the Bible talks about in the Old Testament that if you tithe and give offerings, he said, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing until there's not room enough to receive it. And some people think that means God's going to pour dollar bills down from heaven. And that's not what that means. Um, but he's actually going to give you things that will help you benefit in your life. I remember one time I heard this story about this guy who God spoke to him and said, I want to make you some money because the guy was a faithful giver. God said, I'm going to make you some money. And so God gave him this idea of collecting all the old soap from hotels. You know how sometimes they'll use a little bar of soap? They'll use it a couple times, and they'll just kind of, you know, they'll leave it there, or they'll throw it away or whatever. And he goes, I'm going to show you to, to collect all that and then have it reprocessed or re-whatever. And the guy, uh, and so he would, he had the whole thing set up, so he didn't have to collect it at all. They just sent it somewhere. And the guy made like a half a million dollars before the hotel caught on that this guy is making a lot of money from this used soap. 
And so uh, they shut it down. But he, he made like a half a million dollars before they caught on. And that was God just giving him an idea. And sometimes when God pays you back, I mean, he'll do it in a lot of different ways. He'll give you favor in your job, give you a bonus, give you a raise. There's a lot of different ways, but he can get, also give you a great idea. And uh, he can connect you to people that will prosper you. And, uh, and so make deals go through. Um, but what, you, what we all want is we want God's hand upon our, our lives, but also on our finances. We don't want to just have, well, we don't want to talk about that. We want to know what the Bible, what does the Bible say about it? So when we give, we give with expectancy. Something's going to happen here. Something's going to break loose. Amen? So let's take our offering in our hand. Let's pray over it. Lord, thank you that we can give. So grateful to you for everything that you've done for us. And we're, we're beyond gratitude. We, we have more gratitude than we can even express, Lord, for everything that you've done. Thank you for have, being so good to us and blessing us abundantly in this place. We thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. amen. Go ahead, man. You can pass the offering buckets. So um, please remember those e announcements, and we'll have a great time tonight. I know it's going to be um, lots and lots of food, which men are always interested in, I think. And, uh, and so we'll have a good fellowship, and we'll have a great sermon from somebody. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and he's going to talk tonight about how to really treat your wife as the queen of the house. So all you women, make sure you get your husband there. You get over to that meeting right now. Or the candy store is closed, you know, something like that. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them, please, with me to, um, did I just say that? <laughs> uh, I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to talk to you this morning about the, um, I titled this message, Loving Ourselves on Purpose. Loving Ourselves on Purpose. And... Um, I said it like that because um, I want it to be a little bit shocking because most of us, when we think about Christianity, we think about it as something that we're supposed to deny ourselves, even hate our lives. And so a lot of times what happens is that people, uh, you know, have a low self-esteem or, or they self-depreciation or something like that and low self-value or low self-worth. And so they almost think, like self-hatred almost, and they almost think that because of that, I must be fulfilling that verse. But there's a big difference between denying yourself and hating yourself. There's a gigantic difference. Um, there's a difference between you choosing God above ahead of your own desires, your own wants, and you being so traumatized by sin or terrible things that have happened to you in your life that you don't like yourself. There's a huge difference between that, even though in some ways it may sound the same, it is not the same. It's very much different. And a lot of times, you know, they, people are not, they're not really like, they're not whole people. They're not, they're not, they're not at peace with themselves. They're not good with themselves. They, they struggle so much with feeling normal inside. They, they struggle with their own identity. Who am I? Do I have any value? Do I have any worth? And they struggle so much. And, uh, and I believe with all my heart that the gospel has the answer to all things. And God wants us to have a healthy self-perspective. He, he really does. And, uh, and we're going to look at this. You know, sometimes a few weeks ago I talked about humility. But there's a big difference, huge difference between humility and humiliation. There's a huge difference between guilt and shame. Uh, and, there's, and these things have to be distinguished because a lot of times people get a religious idea about what Christianity is all about. You know, the Bible says that in the beginning, God crowned man, crowned man with glory and honor. Glory and honor, another translation says dignity and worth, dignity and worth. God crowned man with dignity and worth. He put value and esteem upon them. And so what happens is that people want 
that and crave that. They crave that because they were made for that. They were made for glory and honor. They were made to have dignity and worth, to be treated with respect. They were made that way, and so they crave that. And sometimes if they don't get it normal ways, is they try to put it on themselves. And there's nothing more obnoxious than somebody trying to put, put it on themselves. It's kind of like, uh, you know, too much makeup or something. That's probably not the right example to use, but... <laughs> Not, you know, I don't know much about makeup, but I mean, I'm just saying the more the better. But I'm, I'm just kidding. But anyways, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes they try to put too much on or whatever. I'm going to get off this subject right now. But, but when you get around people, you know, the bar need painting, let me, I need to paint it. But I mean, we, there's too much, you know what I mean? We try to put too much on ourselves. And, but, but truthfully, God wants to crown us with glory and honor because we were made for that. The Bible said that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so God doesn't just forgive us of our sin and leave us in a state of deglorification. But uh, he, what he wants to do is he wants to put his glory upon us so that when people see us, they actually see the glory of God. And that comes through not just in some weird way where we're at a meeting somewhere, we're worshiping, our face is shining, but that comes through in our personality and our confidence in how we interact with people. Because a lot of times when people talk to other people, the whole time they're talking to them, they're struggling with feeling accepted. They want acceptance so bad because they don't feel accepted. They want it so bad that it gets kind of weird. That's why people, you know, they, you know, they get into all these weird things where they're, they're I got to get off this subject too. But anyways, but, but they, they desire so much to be accepted. We're, we desire that. And, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with being accepted unless you, you want it so bad that it becomes a source of, of, of security for you, where you are always, you know, it's like you're, uh, I heard this preacher had this sermon, how to kiss a vamp, how to hug a vampire without getting your blood sucked or whatever. But sometimes you get around people and they're so needy that they just suck all the life out of you. And what happens in those situations is that their soul is wounded or their soul is hurting, they're in a lot of pain. And so they, they're looking for something to soothe that pain. It's very hard. You know, I, I gave you this example of humility or this definition of humility. I'm getting kind of goofing my notes up, but uh, this definition of humility, that humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And um, God doesn't come to you and, and demoralize you or... or try to put you down or put you in a, you know, like a defeated, uh, discarded place. But he actually, uh, the gospel is intended to lift people up and give them a sense of dignity and sense of worth and value. You know, the Bible says about Jesus' ministry, the very first sermon, and I think he probably preached this everywhere he went. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to, a list to preach the gospel to the poor. In other words, wherever you are, whatever condition you are in, God, he, Jesus said, I'm anointed to lift you out of that situation, to lift you out of that trouble, to lift you out of that brokenness, to lift you out of that heartache, to lift you out of that despair. I'm, I have come and I'm anointed by the Holy Spirit to do that so that you can be a normal, healthy, loving, caring person where you're not all tangled up inside and all, uh, you know, things don't fire right and you're all goofed up inside. That's not the way God intended. And sometimes people think, well, the gospel is just for, you know, the spiritual aspect of your life. And that's where it begins and ends. And maybe we'll sprinkle a little bit of physical healing in there, but that's it. But actually, the Bible says the gospel is for the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. It's for every aspect of your life. Not that I'm down on, you know, if you say, well, I had to go to a counselor. I'm, I'm for anything that does you good. I'm not putting anything down, but I'm just saying that there is an answer for us found in the gospel and for people that are hurting and people that are broken. I read a book, or actually I'm in the middle of reading this book by this psychiatrist. He's actually a, he's a real good guy, but he has this one chapter in there where he talks about uh, he gives a statistic that people that go to a medical doctor and they'll get a prescription 
of the ones that get that prescription, a third of them, 33%, a whole third of them, will not even go to the drugstore and get the prescription fulfilled. Won't even, a third of them won't even get it uh, filled. And then of the two-thirds that do get it filled, the two-thirds that do get it filled, a large percentage of those either won't take it, they won't take it at all, or they'll take it and they won't follow the directions. Isn't that weird? And they'll take it like sporadically or they'll take it for a little while, then they'll quit taking it. And he goes, why is that? This, this, this psychiatrist, why is that? And he goes, I, this is his... Uh, medical opinion is that people just don't value their self enough to take care of their self. He said that same person will have a pet and they'll take that pet to a vet and the vet, vet prescribes a prescription. They'll go get that prescription filled and they'll make sure that they give that pet, their pet, the, the, the medicine exactly on time every single day, making sure that the, the, the animal is fully taken care of to the utmost degree. And what, what he's, his conclusion was that people love their pets more than they love themselves. Isn't that a sad thing? I mean, people are crazy about their pets, but I don't want to get, that's another subject altogether. I can't, I got to get off that subject. But the gospel, have you ever seen these people that let the dog lick their, they lick the tongue and the, do you know what dogs do with their tongue? I mean, come on, people, come on. I think they should be arrested. But anyways, let me get off that subject. But I just think that the gospel addresses human need at the most profound and comprehensive way. You know, because people are very complex. They're not just simple, simple. They're very complex. They have emotions. Emotions create, emotions are wonderful because it gives you spice. But boy, does it give you some other stuff too, like craziness, right? And, and so uh, we're very complex people. And so the gospel mentions or meets every one of these needs. And religion has this thing where it kind of, uh, it just generalizes this thing. But with the gospel, there is a power element. There's a power element, a transforming element with the gospel. It's not just me telling you great things or great truths or great ideas, but there's a power with it to transform a person's life. And people need to experience not just great principles or great ideas, they need to experience God's power. How many know that's true? That's why Paul said here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said, they hold to an outward form of religion, but reject its real power, keep away from such people. And so it's not good enough just to have religion. We have to have an experience with the power of God. And I think that sometimes what happens is that people uh, they maybe have good, good ideas like religion basically has the idea that, we're, we're, you know, here's what you should do, and it's based on human power, what you can accomplish in and of yourself. And humans are very capable. They can accomplish a lot in their self. But it always, there's always a point where they can't go any further, where the gospel will take you, and the power of the gospel will take you beyond that. And that's what people need to have an encounter with. Amen. And so he says, from such people, People that just are outwardly religious, but they have no power. He said, keep away from such people. You know, it's interesting. For God's power to work, we usually have to believe something different than what we, we believe right now. So like, wherever your lot in life is, if, if there's brokenness or there's lack in an area of your life, maybe your relationships aren't working, your physical body is hurting, or there's some lack Usually what has to happen, you have to start believing something you're not believing right now. If you're suffering emotionally or you're in pain emotionally, you have to start believing something you, that's based on truth that you're not believing right now. You've got to be, believe something different. You know, years ago, I, I mentioned this last week, and several people said it really spoke to them, but several years ago, I'll just say it again, I was praying for this lady and uh, I was getting nowhere. It's frustrating when you pray for somebody, you get nowhere. I mean, have you ever felt that way or been praying for this lady? I was praying for this lady. I was getting nowhere. 
And back then, I used to walk these roads. I used to walk, I used to walk like six miles, three miles down there, turn around, walk three miles back, and I'd pray the whole time, and I'd meditate. Got great sermons, wonderful sermons. And so one day I was walking down there and I was praying and I was meditating and all of a sudden I stopped and I said, Lord, what, what is it with this lady? How come I can't help her? I said, you know, I'm the pastor. I'm the under shepherd. You're the great shepherd. Help me, help me, help her. You know what I mean? That, that movie line, help me, help her. You know that. And uh and so I was sitting there, and I got real quiet. All of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me and said, would you ever see a locomotive train come by here? And I thought about it. Of course, no, you would never see a locomotive train come by here. And the Lord said, why not? And I said, well, there's no tracks. Trains run on tracks. If you see tracks, there's a possibility that you'll see a locomotive train. But trains don't go just anywhere. They're too top heavy, they're too narrow, got steel weeds, wheels too heavy, they'll dig in. They gotta have tracks. Trains run on tracks. Now that's not very profound. Everybody knows that's true, right? But the point that the Lord was making is that the locomotive train is like the power of God. Is like the power of God. And the tracks are like scripture. And that's the, tra- the power of God follows scripture. Now, God can do anything he wants to. Sometimes he can, he'll just, he'll just, you know, just blow everybody's minds. Like, you know, like generally the way people get saved is they hear the gospel preach and they respond to the gospel and they get saved. That's generally how it happens. But I've heard stories where, pe- where Jesus is appearing to Muslims in visions. So someone goes, is that real? God can do anything he wants to do. Right? I remember one time we were having a meeting in in in, um, in Sri Lanka, and uh, there was a lady that came from India, and she had missed her plane, and she was looking for something to do. And she was a very she worked for the government. You could tell that she had a lot of money. She was very you know very well. She was poised, well, very well dressed, had a lot of jewelry on, and she came to our meeting, and she and so she came forward, and she was kind of loud and and she you know talkative and. And uh, very, very, uh, very confident. You could tell she was, you know, probably had money or whatever. And so she came to our meeting and she came forward for prayer. And when we prayed for her, she actually got slain in the spirit. And she said later, she said when she went down, she said she fell into a trance. And she said a man in white appeared to her and said, these men are servants of God have come to show you the way of salvation. Listen to them. So she told us that, and she was not a believer. She was a, a Hindu. Uh, and so, but, but God can do that. God can do anything he wants to do. He doesn't have to listen to me. He can heal anybody when he wants to heal them, whatever. But here's what I do know. If, he, if that doesn't happen, here's what I do know. There's something you can do to assist the power of God to work. And that is you can build scripture into your life because God will perform scripture. You know, there's an interesting verse here in first or in Mark chapter six. But time's going fast. Mark chapter six. It says here that Jesus came to his own hometown of Nazareth in Mark six, verse five and six. It says he was not able to perform any miracles there except that he placed his hands upon a few sick people and healed them. He was greatly surprised because of the people did not have faith. Then Jesus went to the villages around there teaching the people. So like this is like one of the most puzzling verses in the Bible because it doesn't say Jesus wouldn't. It says Jesus couldn't. Let me just try that one more time. It doesn't say that Jesus wouldn't. It says he couldn't. The old King James says he couldn't do. And we don't like to think about Jesus not being able to do something. But it says he couldn't there. And what he marveled at is he marveled at their unbelief. There's only two times the Bible says that Jesus marveled. One was at unbelief. This is one of the places. And the other is he marveled at people's great faith. I'd rather have people God marvel at my great faith instead of my great unbelief. How about you? But it says he couldn't. So he couldn't do 
any miracles there, except he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. So that means that God wanted to, Jesus wanted to. You might like look at that and say, well, he didn't want to here. No, he wanted to. He couldn't. Why couldn't he? Because he marveled because of their unbelief. So how did he, what did he do about their unbelief? How did he rectify it? How did he change it? It says that Jesus went about their villages teaching. Teaching what? Scripture. What's that mean? That means laying out track. Laying out track. Why? So the power of God will, would be able to flow and people could experience God's power. I told you this last week, you know, we, that's talking about healing, but I told you last week that there was a guy that had a, you know, came to this pastor. He had a little, real problem with sin. He had sin in his life that he couldn't get rid of. And he'd repented, even fasted. And so the pastor told him, this is what I want you to do. I want you to memorize Romans 6, 7, and 8. Romans 6, 7, and 8. I want you to memorize it. Commit it to memory. And by the time he got into chapter 8, he had committed chapter 6, chapter 7. He was halfway through chapter 8, and that sin lost its power over his life. So what does that mean? That means he's building tracks by building scripture into his life that the power of God could move on. So it doesn't matter. This is a principle of scripture. It doesn't matter what problem or situation that you are facing that's impossible. If there's a promise, if there is scripture on it, you can build tracks. You can build scripture that the power of God can move on. You know, it's it's like this. You think about this for a second. You know, it's like planting seed. You know, it's like, it'd be, it'd be like me planting my garden and then going out into the forest or into our woods. We, have, we live in a woods. Going out into the woods and going, where's my harvest? Well, you didn't plant here. You planted over there. You expect harvest where you plant. And that's how it is with, that's how it is with the power of God. Where you, are you going to see the power of God? You're going to see it where you've planted seed or planted scripture or another way of saying it where you've laid track. Does that make sense? And so it's, that's why scripture is so important. And one of the things that we're doing this year is we're reading through the New Testament together. Because what are we, why are we doing that? To get scripture into our lives. You know, it's interesting here in Isaiah chapter 53. Because, you know, you think about Nazareth. You think about Nazareth. You know, it's like this. When Jesus, I, I try to f- picture what Jesus felt like when he walked into that town. You know, he preaches there just like he had preached everywhere, preached the same messages, talked about how he was anointed to, to set captives free, heal the sick. He was anointed. He goes into that town, and it's like, I wonder what, he, I wonder what it felt like because how many know that you carry an atmosphere with you? This church has an atmosphere. Your home has an atmosphere. Cities have atmospheres. Towns have atmosphere. Places have atmosphere. When you walk in, if you're sensitive, you can sense the atmosphere. And atmosphere either draws God and releases his power or it, re, re, it kind of pushes, push it, pushes it away. It's like magnets. You know, if you, I, don't, I, mean, I don't understand it all, but sometimes you can take two magnets and if you push them together, they push apart. It's like, I know, I know there's, a, there's a scientific explanation for it that I'm sure somebody could get up here and explain it. But we don't need to hear that right now. We all just know it's true, right? And so you push it, and it's like it's pushing. It won't go together. It's pushing apart. In fact, if it's strong enough, you, you, it's hard to get them together. But then you flip the magnet, and all of a sudden, like we have these black, I don't even know where we got them. We got these black magnets. If you push them at some, if you hold them a certain way, you push them, they push apart. Arr! But then if you flip it, pring, sucks it right in. And that's how atmosphere is. That's how atmosphere is. If you have, if there's an atmosphere of faith and expectancy, an atmosphere of love, an atmosphere of people that are confident in the love of God, that God loves them, accepts them unconditionally. If there's that type of atmosphere, it's like it draws. It actually draws the presence. And you, you walk in there, you go, I feel God's presence here. And because we, we affect the presence because we carry an atmosphere with us. 
That's why you look at the early church. They says they were of one heart, one mind. When they had a prayer meeting, buildings shook. I mean, that could be one of those prayer meetings. The building is shaking, you know. And, and so what I'm trying to say is it's so important for us to have expectancy, right? So here Isaiah says, Isaiah chapter 53, it says, Who has believed our message or our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now everybody agrees that this passage is dealing with Jesus. It's talking about the suffering that Christ uh, made on the, on the cross. And this message, when he said, who has believed our report or our message? The message is the gospel. The message is the gospel. The truth about what Jesus did, that's the message. But notice what he says here. It says, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He's asking a question. See, the arm of the Lord is a manifestation of God's power. That's what the arm of the Lord is, a manifestation of God's power. So to whom is the arm of the Lord, or to whom is God's power manifested? To those who believe the report, the report of Jesus, what he did for us. Not just not necessarily just believing Scripture, even though I believe in believing Scripture, but it's specifically believing what Jesus did because he is the center, the basis of the new covenant. Amen. And so God desires to meet our needs, spirit, soul, and body, not just uh, our spiritual need. He, he desires to meet our needs, spirit, soul, and body. And so people struggle with feelings of worthlessness or low self self-esteem. And they think, some people think that's spiritual, but it's not. If you have feelings of worthlessness or you have low self-esteem, it's going to hinder you from moving forward. It's going to hinder your relationships. It's going to hinder your progress. It's going to hinder you from believing that God would do something good for you. You'll, you'll push it away. You'll push blessing. I remember I had this friend, and uh, he was a, man, he was smart. My wife always tells me I'm smart, but this guy was really smart. And he was, um, and he would start businesses like, like some of us change our shirts. I mean, he would just start businesses, and he, everything he started, he could just make it successful. But at some point, and he had all these ideas, and he was always, you know, like he'd be selling muscle cars, and he'd, he'd say, yeah, I made, I made 20000 on this car. I'm going, well, you made how much? He'd find these cars in barn somewhere and he knew their value and he'd buy them that he'd fix them up and sell them make 20 grand or something just crazy stuff like that then he went to school and became a became a uh, air traffic controller and I mean that pays extremely well and and then he was doing all this other stuff on the side he had all this talent all this ability but he went the time that I knew him he went bankrupt three or four times and it's just like he couldn't, it was like there was something. Finally, I asked him one day, I said, what is it with you? I said, why? Why? I mean, here I'm plugging along, making, you know, just enough to barely keep my head, you know, out of the, out of the keep the wolves away from the doors, if you understand what I'm saying. I mean, I'm collecting tin cans from, in the ditches or something. I mean, I'm just trying to stay afloat. And this guy is like blowing it out of the water. But then he, he, he would say, he would, just, he would just go bankrupt, blow it apart. I said, what is it? You know what he said to me? He said, my dad always told me I'll never amount to anything. He didn't have to sit. Let me think about that. I'll get back to you. He didn't say that. First thing out of his mouth was, my dad told me I'll never amount to anything. And I thought, this guy is unhealthy in his soul. His soul is unhealthy. And so because of it, even though he had tremendous ability, he kept pushing it away. He'd push it away. And because words like that have an effect upon our life. So let me ask this question. As I bring this message to a screeching halt and land this baby. So let me ask you this. How do you honestly feel about yourself? All that was just introduction. This is my sermon. Now. How, how do you honestly ask yourself that question? How do you honestly feel about yourself? See, I believe the gospel is not meant to remain in 
huge, high, I wrote this down, let me read it to you because I, I thought it was pretty poetic. Listen. And when I get done, be, be in awe, would you please just go, wow. Okay, so the gospel is not meant to remain in high celestial synodals hobnobbing with clerical leaks. I'm not done yet. <laughs> The gospel, I was going to really wax elegant at this point. The gospel makes its way through the back alleys and dirt roads and desert places of human existence. That's why Jesus went from place to place. He, he would talk to kings, and then he would talk to a woman that was rejected at a well. The gospel is for every single person. Everywhere visit, he visited the highest and the lowest of broken and lost humanity and humanity. And the result was that the gospel brought a transformation in their lives. Amen. Amen. And so here's the thing. Like I said to you, humility, because I talked about this a few weeks ago, humility, these things have to be defined. Humility is not humiliation. There's a big difference. Just like conviction is not condemnation. And guilt is not the same as shame. Shame is something that people, they feel deeply defiled. They feel that something is seriously wrong with me. I don't fit in. That's not the way God made you to feel. Humility does not require us to feel bad about ourselves or dislike ourselves or dislike who we are. And so that means that all self-demeaning thoughts, what they do is they draw attention away from God in others toward self. See, if, you're pain, if your soul right now is in pain, if your soul right now is in pain, if you're in pain, what do you do? Your attention is drawn to that place of pain. I mean, if your arm hurts, your attention is drawn, my arm, your attention is drawn to that. Pain causes you to focus on the area of pain. So if your soul is in pain because you've been traumatized, you're unconsciously what happens is you focus on yourself. Even if you don't want to, you do. And people come in contact with you, they sense that right away. Because when your soul is in pain, it clamors for attention and affection. And that's why a lot of times what happens is you wonder why people do destructive things, like they drink too much, they eat too much, they take drugs, they do crazy stuff. Why do they do that? Get, become a sex addict. Why? Their soul is in pain. And those things will soothe, soothe the pain. They're trying to soothe the pain. Soothing the pain always leads to a cycle because the more you soothe the pain, the worse you feel about yourself. And so you soothe the pain even more, and then you feel even more worse about yourself. So now you're in a cycle of death that you can't get out of. That's why Jesus said this in Matthew 19. He said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. The word as means the same. In other words, love your neighbor the same way, to the same level as you love yourself. Because love looks like something, your behavior toward your neighbor is a reflection of how you feel about yourself. That's really a powerful point right there. That's why people who are generally, who don't like other people, because I've talked to people, they say, I don't like, I don't like people. Usually what they're say, telling you is they don't like themselves. Because what happens is when you're in relationship with people, you measure your value based on how they react or how they treat you. And because you are all twisted up inside, they generally don't treat you that good. And so you just come away thinking, I just don't like anybody. No, you don't like you. Preach, Dave, I believe I will. I was listening to this uh, guy talk, and he goes... If you sit down and really listen to people, people are fascinating. I thought, really? <laughs> you must be talking a different... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but then I started thinking about that. I thought, you know, he's right. People are fascinating. Just like animals, you know, human you know, animals are fascinating. You know, it's like, who thought, up the, who thought up the giraffe? Come on. Thank God I wasn't born a giraffe. Thank you, Jesus. It's like... <laughs> 
neck? I mean, come on. <laughs> Do we have a neck here or what? I mean, come on. Or a, what's that bird that um, it's got a really long neck and a big body? Ostrich, an ostrich or an emu. Come on. I'm, aren't you thankful you weren't born an emu? Man, thank God for that. But how God made all the animals so different, he makes people that different also. Amen. So let me just say this. I'm, I'll tr try to wrap this up. I'm trying to wrap it up. I got my foot on the brake here. So s listen to this statement. Extending God's love to ourselves first lays the foundation for us to radically love those around us. Let me say that one more time because that's really a good point. Extending God's love to ourselves first lays the foundation for us to radically love those around us. So true humility is actually derailed by self-hatred and undermined by low self-esteem. True humility. So when, when, we, when we extend God's love to ourselves, when we see ourselves as someone that is lovable, you're a lovable little creature, you. Amen? But I mean, I'm making light of this, but this is actually a really serious point. When our souls are starved of love, we have no resource to draw from to truly love others. So here's what I want to just conclude with. You know, in 3 John chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. If you don't like yourself, your soul is not prospering. If you hate, you have self-hatred, your soul is, is not prospering. Notice how he ties external prosperity to, to internal prosperity. So that means truth has to affect our soul first before it affects our circumstances. Truth moves me before it moves mountains. And so we should be more concerned with our internal life than our external situation. Is that right? Because I think poverty of soul is far worse than poverty of finances. How many know that's true? I'd rather be poor and feel healthy inside than be rich and be tor tormented inside with fear and all kinds of things. But the gospel, what, one thing the gospel does is the gospel gives us a new identity in Christ. It's amazing. You know, it's like this. You know, I used to, I tell my wife I love her. She says it more than, she, she initiates it more than I do. I just want to be honest. She tells me she loves me at least once a day, maybe more. And I always tell her I love her back. But I do initiate sometimes. It's not that I don't love her and, 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 and think about it. I just don't say it. I don't know why, but... I, I'm probably thinking about myself, which tells you a lot about me. <laughs> no, <laughs> but but uh, now I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, so so I I used to tell her. Now listen to this. This woman should have a crown in heaven as big as. I used to say, "I love you, dear. If anything changes, I'll let you know." <laughs> let me ask you a question. How how many women that works for you? I just want to see if it works for anybody because I. I don't think it would work for anybody. And so sometimes I go, why do you need to hear it so much? Well, let me ask you a question. Why does God tell you so many times in Scripture, I love you? And not only does he say it once, but he says it in so many different ways. He says it in examples. He says it in parables. He presents it so many different ways. Why? So that you will be totally convinced that he loves you. Amen? The gospel, and that's why, so someone goes, well, that doesn't affect me. See, some people aren't, I think it's a tragedy if you are not affected by that revelation. It's really serious if you're not affected by the revelation that God loves you. You should be affected by it. You should pray to be affected by it. And you should build tracks with Scripture into your life so that, you're, that the power of God can affect you with it. And you can take every scripture, for God so loved the world, for God so loved Steve, that he gave his only begotten son for Steve. 
that if Steve would believe on him, Steve would not perish, but Steve would have everlasting life. You've got to personalize it. See, what happens is the gospel teaches us that we are loved unconditionally. That means when you screw up, you're still loved. When you screw up, you're still loved. And you might get some consequences, but you're still loved. The gospel teaches us that we are accepted by God based on our faith in Jesus, not on the works, lest any man should boast. Truth that doesn't move you, if it doesn't move you, it isn't going to move your circumstances or your life. It has to affect you. And it can affect you because when the power of God is released, when power comes, power moves you. Power will move, it affect you. I don't know if you've ever been affected by truth. It's other than just saying, well, that's a good thought. I'm not talking about a good thought. It's like, bam! Is that too loud? Bam! Bam, bam! <laughs> wow! Lights go on. Wow! Bam! That's not just head knowledge. That is power. When power, the power of truth starts affecting you, it'll start affecting your life. Amen? Amen? So let's all stand together. Let's have the worship team come. So, God wants you to feel about yourself the way he feels about you. Now, some people say, well, that sounds too, too drippy with honey type whatever. But let me just say this to you, that God, I mean, when Jesus walked around, he went, Jesus encountered some pretty heavy stuff. But have you ever read some of the things, especially in John, what Jesus said about himself? He goes, the Father himself loves me. He talked about the son. He goes, the father loves the son. It's like he's almost talking to the third person. The father loves the son. The father has glorified the son and will glorify the son again. He just kept saying stuff like that. He was so confident in God's love. You know, it's like at the River Jordan, we talked about this. He, um, he heard God say, you are my beloved son. God spoke that from heaven. How many would think that would have a, a pretty po powerful effect upon your life? If you were standing there one day and all of a sudden you heard a voice say, Steve? Say it loud, you know, because God always talks loud. Steve? You're my beloved son. And I would go, wow, be pretty cool. In you I'm well pleased. Sound pretty good. You know, the Bible says that we have a more sure word of prophecy. And he talks about scripture. Do you know what it says in scripture? That you are accepted, made us accepted in the beloved. So if God came up to you, he wouldn't look at you and say, I am so frustrated with you. <laughs> You're getting on my last nerve. You know, it's like that. He, would, he wouldn't do that. He'd say, you're my beloved son and my daughter. I'm very pleased with you. And we have to have, the Bible talks about having faith in the love of God. Amen? Well, let's sing this song together and we'll close. For I spoke a word, you were singing all. So, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathe your life in me. And you have been so, so kind to me. And don't
him up coming after me. Cause oh, all you won't kick down, lie you won't hear, or sing like the first time today. His promises are true. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Oh, there's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow. Would you put your hand up and pray this prayer? Say this out loud. Say, Lord, Lord give, me a revelation give me a revelation of your unconditional love, your unconditional love for, me. for me. Say it one more time. Lord, Lord give, me a revelation give me a revelation of your unconditional love, your unconditional love for, me. for me. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Isn't God good? Man, one thing about you, you can take this to the bank. You are loved. Amen. If you're, if you're a Christian, that's no small thing. You're a Christian because God chased you down. Got you in a head, not really, but I mean, he chased you down and revealed himself to you so that you would get saved. And he has plans for you. You know, it's very interesting, this thought, and I don't have time to develop it, but before the foundations of the world, God had a plan for you. And you might not be living that plan right now. You go, this is it? No, you might not be living it right now. But it doesn't mean that God will ever stop if you'll yield to him. If you say, yes, Lord. But what happens so often is because what's going on inside of us is we push things away. We think, I can't do that. I can't take that step because our soul is not healthy. I want you to get healthy. I know that scripture is the truth that sets us free, right? But also, it's great to have other people to pray for you. That's wonderful. It's wonderful to have other people pray for you. So I have some prayer counselors here. They're going to come forward. And if you, if you are in pain, I was at a meeting recently, and, and uh, the guy goes, if you're in, I have a word of knowledge. Somebody's here, here's in pain. And, and the people that were there were all over 65 years old. And I thought to myself, that's not a word of knowledge. <laughs> I'll guarantee you. A word of knowledge would be there's somebody here that's not in pain. <laughs> if you're over 65, you're in pain, buddy. <laughs> so I realized that this is kind of a broad 
you know, net, I'm saying. But I, I'm, I'm talking about start the process today getting healthy. And if you're in pain, you can receive prayer. You might need prayer again, but it's not bad to be prayed for more than once. Even Jesus prayed for people more than once. And so it's not bad to be prayed for more than once. But if you're, but if you're in pain, please let somebody pray for you. So I'm going to dismiss here just a minute. If you, if you have that, and I'm talking, if you're in physical pain too, but I'm talking about soul pain. But you just like, I, I need help to get past this issue or whatever. I need help to get past these words that, of death that were spoken over me. Just as soon as I dismiss, please come forward. These prayer consuls will be glad to pray for you. And we also have some fellowship. Fellowship is healing. And we have some fellowship with some great food back there. I looked out my window. I saw people bring cakes of food. So there's, I'm sure it's all healthy vegetables and with healthy artichoke dip. I'm sure that's what it is. I'm kidding. But you can start your diet tomorrow. But please join us for some fellowship as soon as I dismiss. But I, 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 you know, more than I, God wants you to have an awesome week. Amen. So God bless you, everybody. Don't forget tonight at 530, all the men are welcome to come here. Burger night. God bless you. Have a great week. You're all free to go. But if you need prayer, please come forward. And I want you to know that he can give you today a new future. We hope this message has been a blessing to your life. A copy of this message and additional Destiny Church materials are available at destinychurchexit77.org.